I like that. They dig up the old ones, folks. That stuff you're hearing is 200 years old. Amen. God doesn't change, though, does he? Same yesterday, today, and forever. We're the ones who do the changing. Amen. That's why about 90% of contemporary music I got no use for. Amen. All right. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of Isaiah chapter 6 with me this morning. If you'd like to stand as we open the pages of the infallible book. Isaiah chapter number 6 and verse number 1. In Isaiah chapter number 6 and verse 1, the divine text says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and His train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. With twain he covered his feet. And with twain he did fly. One cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphim unto me, having a live coal in his hand which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Lord, here am I. Send me. Amen. Father, bless his holy word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. Isaiah the prophet said, Woe is me, for I am undone. It takes, has, will, and forever it will take, it will demand an encounter with God before you see yourself the way you are, not as the way you think you are, the image that you project to other people, the facade that you hide behind, the lie that you live in. But the bottom line is, until you see yourself in the presence of God, only then will you understand that your relationship with the Lord will be built upon truth, absolute truth, as God sees you, not as men. And when you come to the Lord, as Charlotte Elliott said, just as I am, then you'll cry with Isaiah, Lord, woe is me. But that's good for you. It's good for all of us. Every last one of us of Adam's race will at one time or another say that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We'll cry from the depths of our soul when we come into the presence of holiness that is beyond description. The human mind can't even comprehend the glory and the power that Isaiah was in the presence of. And when he came into the presence of God, he cried, Woe is me. And Isaiah wrote 66 chapters, considered by many the prince of all the prophets. 66 books in make chapters make up that book of Isaiah, quoted so many times in the New Testament, because of course it is the living word of the living God. And as great a prophet as Isaiah was, and he was a great prophet, when he came into the presence of the holiness of God, all he could cry was, Woe is me. Amen. Notice the context of the text in, Gen in the book of Isaiah 6. The scripture says that it is in the year that King Uzziah died. Uzziah was a king that usurped the office of the priest. Though he were the king, he took it upon himself because of his arrogance to go in and offer a sacrifice to God. And when he did that, God smote him with leprosy from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. He became a leprous at that very instant, like Moses' sister did. A leper immediately. He had turned into leprosy and his body began to decay in the presence of those around. The Lord God wanted them to know that the office of priesthood was something that was blessed, that was ordained, that was sanctified and set apart only for a selected few. Aren't you glad this morning that you are a priest, my friend? that you belong to that high priest who is a priest after the order of Melchizedek and that you didn't take that right upon yourself, that that was given to you by the grace of God 
that you can minister spiritual sacrifices to Almighty God. So the Bible said in Isaiah chapter number 6, the year that King Uzziah died, a leprous king, his flesh falling from his body, the physical stench of him when he, get, when, he, when he was around someone compared to the king of glory. Here's one seated, seated high and lifted up upon a throne. And my friend, the comparison is what he wants you to see first of all. How that high, high, high that God is and how low, low, low that we are. If we could ever get that in our heart and in our soul, God by his grace and mercy would exalt you. He'd lift you up, but you can't lift yourself up by your own bootstrap. It must be done by the power and grace of God. So in the year that King Uzziah died, the leprous king passed from this earth. Here is one that is from everlasting to everlasting. Uzziah died, but the king of glory is seated upon his throne. Uzziah dies, but the king of righteousness reigns forever. Uzziah died, but the seraphim club fly, fly before him. With two of their wings they cover their face. With two of their wings they cover their feet. And with two of their wings they fly. What is a seraphim? It's a ball of fire that God made to give him glory. As far as I know, the only purpose of a seraphim is to fly around the throne and cry, Holy, holy, holy. And so my friend, it did exist. Exactly what it was made to do. Every indication is that the seraphim were sinless beings. They had never sinned and they had never come into the condemnation and corruption of mankind. Yet in the presence of a holy God, they had to cover their face. They had to cover their feet because even though they were sinless, this one seated upon the throne was infinitely greater and higher than they could possibly be. Hallelujah to God. Can you get a picture of what you're looking at here? You're looking at glory. And glory is His and His alone. Glory God Almighty can pour out upon you. He can wrap you in it. He can let you see it. But it's still His glory and forever will be. So in the book of Isaiah chapter number 6. We see a leprous king dying and we see the king of glory exalted and lifted up and the prophet of God bowing down and saying, whoa, 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 is me. And my friend, when you confess that and confess it rightfully from your soul, the righteousness of Jesus Christ God will take and he'll cover your sin and he'll wash it away. He'll make you what you can't be any other way. But by the grace of God, the Bible said that we might be made the righteousness of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. Holy, holy, holy. And so glory is manifested. In the book of Psalm, chapter number 24, let's take a look at some of the passages where we see it in the Old Testament. In Psalm 24, in verse number 7, the Bible said, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lift up ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift him up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. Selah! What you have in the book of Psalm chapter number 24 is where 2,500 singers was on this side. 2,500 singers on this side. A total of 5,000 men were gathered together for one sole purpose and that was to sing glory to God. One would sing, Who is the King of Glory? The other side would answer, The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. That was a beautiful picture of the ascent up into the very presence of Almighty God Himself. Who would dare come up into the presence of Almighty God? Who would approach the throne of that Eternal One? My friend, the only way it can be done is by righteousness, and the only righteousness that could ever approach into the presence of God is not the righteousness of man, but is the righteousness of the sinless, perfect Son of God. Do you want to go into His presence one day? Do you want to be lifted up from the dunghill into the King's castle? Do you want to stand before the One that is from everlasting to everlasting. The only way you can do it is for the righteousness of the Son of God to be applied to your soul. And so they entered in to the presence of the Lord. This is a type. 
when they went up to when they went up that mountain they climbed up to the presence of the Lord it was the same as when that tabernacle was pitched in the wilderness and that ark of the covenant approached into where it was it was given as a type of coming before God coming before him coming to him and those announcing as you approached unto that eternal being. The day will come when my soul and spirit leaves this body. I have no idea when that day comes, but it will come. And when that day comes, this body will go back to where it came from, but I will approach under the throne of Almighty God. And make no mistake about it, I intend as I approach to the throne of Almighty God to have one name on my lips, and that's the name of Jesus. There is no doubt that they know that my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Who will dare approach into the throne of God? Well, make no mistake about it today. I have him in my heart and in my soul. I didn't pick him up when I walked through the door. And I won't hang him up when I walk back outside. He came in here with me. He'll leave out of here with me. Tomorrow morning when I, get a, when I wake up, he'll be just as real to me as he is at this very moment as I stand in this pulpit. If he's not real to you Monday morning, Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning, then my friend, he's not real at all. He'll have nothing to do with hypocrisy. Blessed be the name of the Son of God. So glory is something that we all are concerned about in the Scripture. In the book of Exodus chapter number 24 and verse number 15, the Bible makes this statement. Exodus chapter number 24 and verse number 15, the Scripture says, And Moses went up into the mount. And a cloud covered the mount, and the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days, and the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Moses is getting a taste of something that's far greater than any miracle that he'd ever seen performed. In Exodus chapter number 33 and verse number 9, we read these words. It came to pass as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talked with Moses. And the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle, and all the people rose up in worship, every man in his tent door. Moses, my friend, has been wrapped up in the glory of God. Imagine a little tent that they carry from one place to the next. That's all it is. It's just a tent. But when God shows up, everything begins to change. When he shows up at Temple Baptist Church, it all changes. <coughs> Until then, it's just a building made out of stone and brick and wood and carpet and lights and electricity and wiring, plumbing. But when he shows up, it becomes the habitation of God through the Spirit. And those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life who have the Holy Ghost dwelling in their soul are literally ignited. At that moment, they come alive. Their spirit begins to leap within their soul. Why? Because of the glory of God as he approaches unto his own. Now take Moses, for example. When he was in the wilderness, the Bible said he saw a bush burning. And that bush burned and it was not consumed. That was quite a sight. Moses witnessed that. Then think the fact that when Moses went back into the land of Egypt to deliver the people from Egyptian bondage, he watched the Nile River turn to blood. He watched the miracles of God as he came and he judged all the gods of the Egyptians. Moses witnessed all that. He saw my friend the Red Sea when he came to the bank of it and raised up the rod of God and said, stand still and see the power of God, the glory of the Lord. And that sea was split asunder. And the Bible said they went across on dry ground. Moses was a witness to all of that. But my friend, all it did in Moses was whip his appetite. All it did for Moses was build a desire inside Moses for something greater. A lot of people in the church, they're satisfied with seeing something. There's a lot of folks that come to the house of God. If they can get God to answer a prayer every once in a while and maybe even have a miracle happen in their family, that's good enough for them. There's a crowd that comes to church. They've got fire insurance, and that's good enough for them. They don't care about anything more than that. That's good enough. But there are those that come to the house of God that know that there's a much, much more than a miracle. 
They know there's more going on than what God can do. That even if they saw the glory of God move down through the aisles of this church, if they saw the glory of God as it wrapped itself around everyone in this house, they say that's a great thing indeed. Yes, it is. But there's more than that. I want you to notice what Moses said over here to the Lord God in the book of Exodus chapter number 33 and verse number 18. And Moses said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Well, Moses had been wrapped in glory. He had stood in glory. He had, been, he had seen glory all around him. And yet here we find him saying, Lord, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. And will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. What he said to Moses was, I'm going to let you see the goodness of my glory. You see, the glory of God manifests itself in a lot of different ways. I'm going to let you see goodness. And when he went before Moses, he proclaimed how that that goodness forgives, restores, saves, heals, ministers grace to all, and abounds in its ability. Everyone in this house this morning, at one time or another, the goodness of God has come down upon your soul, and he has blessed you. He has been good to you. You know, even if you acknowledge him, some of you may say you're an atheist, agnostic, whatever you claim to be. It makes no difference. The Bible says he causes the sun to shine on the just and the unjust. He's been good to you. Every soul in America that gets up tomorrow morning at one time or another in their life would have to confess the Lord has been good to us. He's been good to this nation. He's blessed this country. We reap the benefits now of hundreds of years of God all Almighty's blessing and now we've turned on him and we spit in his face and we mock him and we make fun of him and yet him because of his goodness his goodness still flows like grace and mercy and the Lord said the Lord is good and gracious and long-suffering to us word but the Lord said Moses I want you to understand something I got to put you somewhere that you can handle this so he put him in the cliff of the rock there was a rock by where God was. And that rock would made it possible for Moses to enjoy what God was going to be to him. You see, my friend, without the Lord Jesus Christ, who is that rock, we have nothing to stand on. We have nowhere to hide. We got nowhere to drink. We got no foundation for what we are. We have no manner of knowing where we've been or where we're going. There's no Ebenezer for us. There's no rock to put in the bottom of the Jordan River. There's no rock to take out of that river without that rock and he is our rock there is no foundation for the temple there is no foundation for the building of God he is our rock I can't approach God but I can sure be put in the cliff of the rock that's where God put me he put me in the cliff of the rock it's in Jesus that I get an inkling of who the father is it's through Jesus that I begin to appreciate my heavenly father it's through Jesus that he he he, he presents me, introduces me to God the Father. It's the Son that tells me about the Father. It's the Son that makes the Father real to me. No man knows the Father but the Son, and no man knows the Son but the Father. There is that reciprocation. There's that understanding of God. If I reject the Son, I reject the Father. If I deny the Son, I deny the Father. There are those who go around and say, I believe in God. I believe in God the Father. I believe in the Creator. You don't believe in anything until you believe in Jesus. You don't have a clue who you're talking about. But with the Son, you have a direct access unto the Father. And so Moses said, I want to see your glory. I've got to see your glory. I've been wrapped up in clouds. I've seen power. I know miracles. I've watched Red Sea split. But i got to get close to you. i got to know you. It's Paul that said that I might know him. When do you ever get that desire in your soul, dear friend? What does it take to get you to have a hunger for God? As David said, as the heart panteth after the water broke. When does it build inside you? Or are you satisfied with what God does for you? And you're just there 
with your hand out and you're a receiver, but there's no reciprocation. There's no giving back. There's no thankfulness rising from the soul. God looks at you and said, well, here's the trough. Let's pour some slop into it and let's watch the hogs as they pounce on the food. That's the way a lot of Christians are. They put the slop in the trough. They never raise their head. They get in there and fight for the next morsel and they couldn't care less about where it comes from. I'm breathing because he's alive. I look at you because he lives. I got a mind and soul because God Almighty is God Almighty. I'm saved today because of his power and his glory. I exist because he exists. I got no reason to live without him. Everything that has any meaning is related to him. I want to lift my head from the trough. I want to look up from the one from whence cometh my salvation. I want to glorify his holy name for who he is and what he's done for me. Bless the name of the son of the living God. Amen. What does it take, dear friend, to raise you from a hog pen to where you glorify the Lord of glory? Oh, yes. May this is my, maybe my last time I ever preach on this earth. That's why I preach the way I do. I live to preach. And my friend, if I'm gone, I'm gone. And I know where I'm going. Amen. Yeah. Amen. 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 Some of you don't get that. It flew right across the top of your head. Amen. Some of you worry about this. You worry about that. Your life is this. This is all you think about is a dollar bill. That's all you care about is somebody else. And I'm going to tell you right now, if this is the last breath I draw, I know where I'm going. That's what I live for. Amen. Somewhere you got to get it in your soul that your life matters if you got a relationship with God. And if you don't have a relationship with God, you're nothing but a selfish pig. And all you've got is your head in the trough. And you live for yourself. And it's what God can do for you. It's not what he is to you. He's my very lifeblood. And I got that settled. If this is my last day on earth and I die, I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded he's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. If Satan can keep you in fear, he'll rob you of your very soul. And the fear of death is one of the worst fears that men will ever know. The fear of death is the power of Satan over your life. And all men naturally fear death until you get it settled where you're going. And then you get it like the Apostle Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And if you could ever get to that point where you say to him, for me to live is Christ and die is gain. I listened to a veteran the other day. And that veteran said this. Iraq war veteran or Afghanistan. One of our boys over there, he's what he said. He, they said, how do you deal with that? When you go into combat and you know the bullets are flying and you're liable to get killed at any moment. He said, it's, he said, it's simple. He said, I'm dead already. Think about it. Of course, he's still alive. He said, I'm dead already. Amen. The church has no power in this country. The church has no witness and testimony because the church lives by the same standard the world lives by. It has no higher vision than the world has. It goes from day to day by licking the devil and begging him and seeking the favor of Satan instead of turning your life over to the Lord God Almighty. When you ever do that and you ever realize that your life, your breath, the next breath you breathe, the next moment you live, the next, next time your heart beats, it's in his hands and that's where I want it. Why well, wouldn't trust men as far as I could throw them? Amen. Most of the men that I've met in this life, I wouldn't trust you as far as I could throw you. But I trust him. I trust him. Hallelujah to God. I trust him. And then finally, I'll close with some of this. Israel saw the glory of God. In the book of Exodus chapter number 16 and verse number 7. And in the morning, then you shall see the glory of God, the glory of the Lord, for that he heareth your murmurings against the Lord. 
And what are we that ye murmur against us? This murmuring, this complaining, this running of the mouth, this, these lips that are constantly griping and complaining are going to have a hard time seeing the glory of the Lord. And it comes on us. We're all guilty of it. I had to get on my face and confess, Lord, I've been running my mouth too much. The Holy Spirit convicted me. He wouldn't let me get up until I confessed it. I've been running my mouth too much. And I confess that that's coming out of my mouth. Grapping, complaining, picking, nitpicking. This little Mickey Mouse nothing. This little nothing over here. This thing, that thing. But I know people today, they get so holy and they get so sanctified. You can't do anything with a person like that. You can't help somebody that can't, that, that's, that's perfect. Somebody came the other day and said, I know this preacher, he's preaching to people now that he's perfect. Let me tell you something about it. The day will come, and it probably won't be long, when God puts him down to the point where he realizes it ain't nobody on this earth perfect. The only perfection is the Son of God. Jesus is perfect. And he's my righteousness. Hallelujah to God, that's the one I trust today. They saw the glory of God. I'm going to close with this. There is glory that we can see. What glory do we see? Well, I don't see the Red Sea part. I don't see that. I don't see the gods of Egypt judged. I don't see Mount Sinai with a smoke up on it. I don't see that. I don't see the glory of God coming down on the tabernacle. I can see it in my spirit. I can see it in my mind. But let me tell you something I can see. I can see Calvary 2,000 years ago. I can see one up there bleeding and dying for my sins. I can see the tomb that they laid him in, but I know that tomb is empty. If they had his body, they'd been parading it everywhere in Jerusalem. Would still been on display what was left after 2,000 years. You better believe it that I could see him raised from the dead and ascend to the right hand of the Father and coming again as King of kings and Lord of lords. That spiritual vision that God gives his people is more real than your physical eyes because your physical eyes can deceive you, the Holy Ghost will never deceive you. There's glory that Brother Baloo used to sing, that I'll die on the battlefield with glory in my soul. Don't be robbed of your heritage, Christian. Don't let this, this current contemporary generation of self-loving reprobates rob you of your power with God. Don't let him do it. There's power for you. Why don't you come and ask him this morning, God, what that preacher said spoke to my heart. He's telling the truth. My whole life is tied up with this life and what I get here and what I get now. And that's all I can think about. And by doing that, I have robbed myself of the glory and the power of the world to come and of Christ who's coming soon. And he's coming soon. He's coming soon. They've received his spirit. They'll receive him. The Antichrist is at the door. And Christ is at the door too. Father, in thy name we pray. Jesus. I preached what you put on my heart, Lord. I delivered my soul. Some will receive it and some won't. Some will go home and take what I said to them and they'll think about it this afternoon. Many others will go home, turn the TV on, kick back and forget that there is even a service tonight or anything even matters except this present evil world. Some believe and some won't. Lord, that's not my place. My place is to preach the word. That's your work as to the believing. In thy holy name I pray, Lord. In Jesus' name I ask it. For Jesus' sake I pray. Amen. What have we got, brother? Page 401 in your All-American. <laughs> Only trust in him now. 
Joe, listen to me for just a minute. This is important. For those of you that don't know, I can walk up the steps at home and I'm out of breath. I did the other day. My wife looked at me and said, what's wrong with you? I said, I'm out of breath. And she could tell. I, couldn't, I was out of breath. I had to rest by just walking up the steps. That's all it took. I was completely out of breath. But I can preach for 30 minutes. And I'm not out of breath. Now explain that. I feel good right now. Never got out of breath. You know why? Because I'm not preaching on my own power. There's one greater than me. Much, much greater than me. Bless his holy name. Bless your name, Savior. Not out of breath. Not even tired. After 30 or 45 minutes of preaching. But I can walk up the steps and I'm out of breath at home. Explain that. It's Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> Take another verse. Oh, Jesus I looked at the front page of the Knoxville News Sentinel. You can do that on an iPad, you know. You got the paper, and you can look at the. You can get the paper every day like that. It won't cost you a dime. We'll let you know that. And on the paper this morning, they had a Tennessee Highway Patrol lieutenant training a bunch of recruits into the Highway Patrol. Anybody see that? Some of you did. And he was in their face screaming. He reminded me of the drill instructor at Paris Island. That's exactly the way they operate. Here's the thing. He was making Tennessee Highway Patrolmen. He was preparing them for the Highway Patrol. It's not, a, it's not fun out there, folks. That's a hard job. And he was in their face, and he was trying to get their attention and show them what kind of life they're getting ready for. It. Discipline, discipline, discipline. So I'm not being critical, just observant. But I thought to myself, I'm up here preaching at you. I'm yelling at you. I'm screaming at you. I'm trying to get your attention. And a lot of people think that's crazy. They like, they like smooth talk when they go into a church. But folks, what I'm talking to you about this morning is infinitely higher than what that highway patrolman was doing. And that's not to belittle him. His work's a good work, no question about that. And he's doing his job, and that's all great. I'm not being critical. But I'm talking about your eternal soul. I'm talking about your relationship with the Lord. Amen. Amen. How many of you ever went through Marine Corps boot camp? I had a drill instructor get in your face and scream at you, take his fist just like that. And I don't know if they still do it, but they used to take their fist just like that, buddy, and knock you flat of your back and tell you, get up now and get mad. They wanted you to get mad. They wanted to fight. They wanted to fight. That's the way it was. That's what it took. That's what it took <clears throat> to beat you into submission, I guess. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Got plenty of beating, believe me. <clears throat> But it was about being a Marine. It's about being a highway patrolman. I'm talking to you about eternity. I'm talking about your future. I'm talking about where you're going. So listen carefully to what I'm saying to you. Amen. I'm not being mean. And I'm not making excuses. I'm telling you that what I'm talking about is very important. Very important. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll let you go. Brother, Brother Gibson, will you dismiss us? Yeah, Father, we thank the Lord.